protests sweeping the country in response to the killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police have reignited an ongoing national conversation about police brutality in black communities. And in video after video of demonstrators clashing with police, the protests are also revealing an aggressive response to civil unrest that has become common in American policing. So how did law enforcement come to use these aggressive militarized tactics to respond to protests? And how have they continued today? 20 years ago, one protest changed the way police respond to civil disorder. The 1999 demonstrations against the World Trade Organization in Seattle. The 1999 uh, WTO protests in Seattle were a turning point for the American police in terms of how they think about how to handle uh, crowd events, particularly mass demonstrations. The battle for Seattle, as it came to be known, began peacefully, but escalated into multiple days of confrontations, mostly after police attempted to disperse protesters with tear gas and pepper spray. After the civil unrest of the 1960s, the government found that a forceful response from the police actually escalated conflicts. So this led police to start using this tactic called negotiated management, where they communicated with protesters before demonstrations and agreed on a plan. And for several decades, this was how police managed protests. Until the WTO demonstrations in Seattle. Thousands of anti-globalization demonstrators blocked the streets around the convention center, and things escalated quickly. A small group of disruptive protesters would not consult with the police, and so this policy of negotiated management completely broke down. I was sent to um, the uh, WTO meetings in Seattle uh, to cover the environmental side. I just started covering the environmental beat for the Wall Street Journal. What I noticed at the time, though, was that the Seattle Police Department seemed, uh, it, they, it didn't seem like there was very many uh, police in, in comparison to the protesters. So I was actually, had a little bit of, um, you know, I was nervous. I, you know, I'm not sure why I was nervous, but it was almost a, like a premonition. Norm Stamper was the Seattle police chief at the time. We had 50, 60,000 people on the streets of Seattle. It was a city at the time of 530,000 with uh, about 900 available police officers. He says he now regrets how he directed his officers to handle the demonstrations. I made the biggest mistake of my career by authorizing the use of chemical agents against nonviolent, non-threatening protesters. Of what happened in Seattle is really consistent with what we know from a large body of research on crowd psychology. And we know that when uh, crowds feel that they're engaged in peaceful, lawful behavior, and the police use force against them or make mass arrests against them, uh, the, the reaction is often going to be uh, defiance and rebellion uh, rather than uh, sort of people just peacefully saying, OK, I'm going to go home now. Immediately after the protests, Stamper resigned, and he has since dedicated the rest of his career to police reform. Though there were few injuries and no deaths, the images coming out of Seattle depicted a city that had lost control of its streets, and so control became a key theme for police departments in the aftermath. Seattle really, to me, um, marked uh, the beginning of like a, a whole new era in the way police dealt with uh, protests. To me, 20 years later, the, the greatest significance of all is that the lessons we learned are not generally being followed in the rest of the country. Following Seattle, um, other law enforcement agencies around the country realized that they had events that were coming up that very likely uh, they would experience some of the same protests that they had seen in Seattle and some of the potential disruption. And they were going to need to deal with this new way of doing protest, this leaderless, um, disruptive, um, not willing to negotiate with police. Howard Jordan was the chief of police in Oakland, California during the Occupy protests, and he said his officers struggled with the leaderless structure of the demonstration. Our policies, you know, required us to meet with demonstrators and try to come up with a peaceful solution, sort of, you know, work out a, a deal where they stay on their side of the street and we stay on our side of the street and that's it. But um, as time went on over the, the years, uh, even today, obviously, um, that stuff kind of went away. In the early 1990s, the U.S. Department of Defense created the 1033 program, which gave unused military equipment to local law enforcement free of charge. 
The Justice Department also started giving money to local agencies for policing programs, training, and equipment. After September 11th and the ensuing wars abroad, the militarization of U.S. law enforcement kicked into a new gear. The newly created Department of Homeland Security started granting money to states for equipment and training related to anti-terrorism strategies. That kind of combination of um, ratcheting up the police response to the anti-globalization protesters and then being concerned about the presence of terrorists uh, in these crowd events, um, these things led American police to really adopt much more intensive, much more invasive approaches for uh, handling these events. And then came the unrest in Ferguson, Missouri, after Michael Brown, an unarmed black teenager, was shot and killed by police. More than 50 law enforcement agencies were involved in the response to Ferguson and revealed a complete breakdown of communication and strategies. The police response to the protests in and around Ferguson uh, was, uh, was, was really almost a case study of sort of how not to respond to these incidents. It also exposed just how militarized local law enforcement had gotten. In response, the Obama administration started restricting standards on the provision of military-style equipment to local police departments. Later, they created a task force on American policing and released a comprehensive report detailing what went wrong in Ferguson, laying out policy plans for police reform. Despite the efforts of the Obama administration, the response to today's protests have shown that the equipment and tactics used by police are not standardized. President Trump signed an executive order reversing Obama's restrictions on military equipment in 2017 and has called himself the law and order president. Law enforcement agencies across the country still hold billions of dollars worth of tactical equipment. But the recent protests are already leading to changes. There's a renewed push by lawmakers to shut down the surplus military equipment program, and some cities have started restricting the use of chemical and less lethal weapons by police. There's also a growing movement to defund local police departments and reinvest that money. That incident in Minneapolis, it's not good for law enforcement. We just took uh, 20 years, we just went 20 years backwards. Okay, that's, that's not, we're not gonna recover from that anytime soon. Stamper says he understands the complexity of systemically reforming the police, but sees this moment as a golden opportunity. As I do believe after all the years that I've been clamoring for police reform, uh, we're at a crossroads. The timing could not be better for legitimate reform.